Well, good morning, Greenwich, and welcome to the Thursday, June 6th edition of the Basement Academy. Today marks the 80th anniversary of the Allies' invasion at Normandy. I've been watching some um, documentaries on World War II, not just the D-Day invasion, but other battles and footage, and just an amazing, amazing witness to courage, humanity, <laughs> the poignant reality, the, the harshness and the, the, the horror of war. But God bless those men, uh, women who were serving uh, in part of that invasion, planning that, gave their lives. We are free today, uh, we believe, because of those acts of heroism and, and courage and laying down one's life for one's country and one's friends. We're going to read the, that passage from John 15. So anyway, just thought it'd be appropriate to, to mark that day and give gratitude to God for the courage of others that serves our lives. Let me begin with our morning psalm, Psalm 126, another of the pilgrim psalms. Seems like that's what I'm choosing this week, right? Psalm 126. When the Lord brought back the captives to Zion, we were like men who dreamed. Our mouths were filled with laughter, our tongues with songs of joy. Then it was said among the nations, the Lord has done great things for them. The Lord has done great things for us, and we are filled with joy. Restore our fortunes, O Lord, like streams in the Negev. Those who sow in tears will reap with songs of joy. He who goes out weeping, carrying seed to sow, will return with songs of joy carrying sheaves with him. Mm. Just six little verses. Context is return from exile, coming home. The homecoming that God offered Israel brought about and the homecoming that we experience in Christ, the prodigals coming home. The Lord has done great things for us. And the way he's done that is through our great Savior, Jesus, the friend of, uh, of sinners. Let me read the fourth verse and do some reflecting with you for a few moments. Jesus, what a guide and keeper. While the tempest still is high, storms about me, night o'ertakes me. He, my pilot, hears my cry. Hallelujah, what a Savior. Hallelujah, what a friend. Saving, helping, keeping, loving. He is with me to the end. I'm going to talk about the refrain uh, today. And reading that every day, let's, let's talk about it a little bit. And so here, Chapman gives us a picture of the storms of life. Jesus, what a guide and keeper while the tempest still is high. The tempest of life. James talks, uh, writes about uh, considering it all joy when you encounter trials of many kinds or various kinds. God uses the trials, the challenges, the testings of our life. We live east of Eden. We've talked about that, right? East of Eden, it's thorns and thistles, it's pain, it's sorrow, it's difficulty, it's tempest. And so Jesus is our friend. He is our guide. In the midst of the storm, he guides us, he keeps us, he protects us. So it's that image of guidance and, and, and protection. While the tempest still is high, storms about me, night or takes me. And we've all had this experience. Um, we had an experience uh, almost two weeks ago, uh, as I think I've mentioned, was 
down at a wedding in Charlottesville with some uh, friends of the church. And as we're driving back, uh, that it was that Saturday, uh, I'm sorry, the Sunday night storm of Memorial Day weekend. We got a little bit here, but there was a tornado in Culpeper, Culpeper County. And we drove through that storm, driving home, trying to beat the storm. Thankfully, we did. But for about 45 minutes, driving through some country roads, we were not on 29. Don't know if that would have been any better. But there are tree-lined canopy uh, roads, and we're seeing leaves blow in both directions. The wind is swirling. We're seeing branches. I mean, there was some anxiety. We'll just say it that way. The storm was about us. And so we were singing, humming hymns, and literally praying out loud, Chris and I word, for about 30, 45 minutes. Thankfully, we made the storm. He was our guide and, and keeper in that storm. It was dark. It was rainy. I mean, all the, so, so I can identify with this verse from a recent uh, experience. And so maybe the picture, when it introduces the language of he, my pilot, hears my cry, maybe this is the disciples in the storm on the, in the boat, Sea of Galilee, and they're crying out. And there, there's two stories. One, Jesus comes walking to them. Another, where Jesus is in the boat and um, uh, he's sleeping and, Lord, Lord, don't you care about us? And so the picture of the storm capturing the disciples or the storm overtaking them, I think is a metaphor, right? This, the storm here is the metaphor for life, the difficulty of life, the challenges and the trials uh, of life. He is our friend then. He is the pilot of our ship. He is the one who will guide us safely to the other shore. Sometimes we get to thinking about salvation only in the context of saving us from sin. Yes, it is that, but it is not only that. Salvation, we, we, we did this, we studied this in our um, theology series, golly, what was that, almost four years ago? Salvation is not just saving from sin, saving our souls, pardoning our debt. It is those things, but it is so much more. One of the root meanings of salvation is rescue, deliverance. And so the Exodus uh, event, um, the Exodus story from the Old Testament, they are slaves. It's Pharaoh who's doing the sinning, right, as it were. Um, and so, but but salvation, God delivered them through the Red Sea and the stormy, <laughs> you know, the, the water piled up on either side and they're going through it. No doubt Israel was anxious. Is the water going to come over and, and, and cover us? And so he is our friend in saving us from sin, yes, but it's so much more than that. It's in our temptations, in our weakness, as we're stumbling about that he is our strength. It's in our loss and our sorrow and our grief when we're overwhelmed. He's our comfort, even when my heart is breaking and the billows or billows of grief are rolling over us. And here now, the storms of life. He rescues us, he keeps us, he protects us, he guides us. There's not a one of us listening to this or speaking it that hasn't experienced times of great confusion. Family life um, is challenging. What's happening, uh, you know, when September 11 happened, the, 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 the chaos of that day, uh, the, the, the chaos of the pandemic, you know, we've all walked through some really challenging things. And so our... God, our, our Savior, Jesus, our great Savior, helps us. He keeps us. Whether it's Daniel in the lion's den, the three friends in the fiery furnace, uh, the exile return from exile, the Lord has done great things for us. We were like men who dreamed, coming back home. 
And so I hope we understand Jesus as a friend in the broadest sense, in this largest sense, not just saving our, our souls. And so I love the refrain, hallelujah, what a savior, hallelujah, what a friend. There's exclamation points going on there, right? If you read the text in the hymnal. And so we should sing it that way, hallelujah, what a savior. Hallelujah, what a friend. <laughs> you know, the exclamation point gives that emphasis. We almost lift our voice when we're singing or reading where it has been punctuated that way. Saving, helping, keeping, loving. He is with me to the end. And so I think the saving, helping, keeping, loving, that image, that's the friend we have in Jesus. <laughs> What a friend we have in Jesus. All our sins and griefs to bear. You know, that other wonderful hymn that sings about the friendship of Jesus. John chapter 15. Jesus in the upper room at the, at, with the disciples at the Last Supper has washed their feet already. He, he, he says this, my, my command is that you love each other as I have loved you. That's verse 12. Greater love has no one than this, that he lay down his life for his friends. You are my friends. If you do what I command, I, I no longer call you servants because a servant does not know his master's business. Instead, I have called you friends for everything that I have learned from my father I have made known to you. You did not choose me, but I chose you and appointed you to go and bear fruit, fruit that will last. Then the father will give you whatever you ask in my name. And this is what my command, love each other. So you are my friends if you do what I command. I'm just Love one another. Just love each other. <laughs> and he's talking to the disciples, and, and it's not easy to love other people. It's not easy to love other people. That's all Jesus asks. We show our friendship to Jesus by doing what he asks. Um, he calls us friends. The Proverbs guides us with some language about what a friend is like. A friend loves at all times. Proverbs 17, 17. We have a friend who sticks closer than a brother. Proverbs 18, 24. The pleasantness of one's friend springs from his earnest counsel. Proverbs 27, verse 9. Faithful are the wounds of a friend. Proverbs 27, 6. The loyalty of the integrity, the honesty that a friend, a friend will say what we need to hear. Enemies multiply kisses, it says, but friends will speak an earnest word. Jesus speaks the earnest word. He'll call us to account for our behavior that is not helping us. It's not, it's not only dishonoring to him. It doesn't help us. Our sin destroys us. Our attitudes we have, the way we treat others, our judgment the, the, the self-destructive, proud, slothful, lustful, greedy tendencies of our lives. That it's not that he's mad at us. It's that he's our friend. He wants the best for us. And a good friend will say, hey, I, I, I hope you don't take this the wrong way, but I don't think this is helping you. And so I'm not, you know, a, a friend is willing to risk the, 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 the defensiveness and the awkwardness because there's a deeper loyalty. And so Jesus is our friend. He, he wants only the, the best for us. And so he'll offer that, that strong, earnest, heartfelt word and counsel. And he's going to stick with us. He loves at all times. He's not a fair weather friend. Uh, James chapter 2. I'd forgotten about this. And, and, and like, oh, I think there's a verse in there. James is writing about faith and works and the like. He says, the scripture was fulfilled that says, Abraham believed God and it was credited to him as righteousness. That's where we get this understanding of salvation by faith, right? 
and he was called God's friend. Abraham was called God's friend because he trusted God. He took God at his word. That's what leads to salvation. Salvation by faith is we take God at his word, that Jesus has offered his life for our sin. We take God at his word. Okay, I don't know how all that works, God, but I'm taking you at your word. I'm going to trust Jesus. Okay? And that is where our friendship with God begins. Just take him at his word. He is our friend. I found myself thinking and preparing for this reflection. He is our friend. Are we his friend? There are friendships that run one direction, right? You know, we, we, we've all had them. Typically, we see this in younger years, middle school, high school, childhood, maybe early adulthood. Somebody says, you know, oh, you're my friend. You're my best friend, BFF, best friends forever. But it's only one way. It's only doing what they want to do. It's only, they only get to talk about their concerns and their troubles. When, when we want to share our concerns, oh, they don't seem to have time or they get distracted or we've got to move on. And, and there are these one-way friendships. Some of us maybe have experienced some of that over the years. I pray that we don't have only a one-way friendship with Jesus, that, that it's only, you know, we only go to him when we need something, right? That, that's, that's the one-way friendship, you know? The friend has something else they've got going. We're, we're, we're free on Friday night, but they're occupied, you know? Uh, they, they might want us to break our plans to do something with them because, hey, I thought you were my friend. Don't you do the things I want? And, and so one way, we have to be careful about not having a one-way friendship where all the bending, all the giving, all the sacrificing, all the listening, all the loyalty, as it were, just goes from Jesus to us. Do we spend time in his word? Do we give our attention to what he says? You are my friends if you do what I command. And it's, it's one simple command he's asking here. I and mean, the context is very clear. Love each other as I have loved you. I've washed your feet. I've cared for you. Just love one another. Just, just, just do that. To some degree, I think we have to confess that all of us have an aspect of a one-way friendship with Jesus, where we're really, you know, we're, we we come to Him when we have a need. But when things are going great. We're not thinking so much about Jesus, are we? We might, we might not spend as much time in our prayers and, and, and reading his word and giving our attention to loving others. The, the political world we live in invites us to, to distraction and away from a friendship with Jesus and a friendship with the world where the world is about power and about tribalism and the like. But that's not friendship with Jesus. Friendship with Jesus is a love that transcends the tribes, that loves those in the tribe, certainly, you know, loves your own, loves, loves one another, but also loves the enemy. And so what would it look like if we were to be friends with Jesus? He is our friend. Are we his friend? Do we listen to him? Do we listen to his concerns for the world do we make his concerns our concerns? Do we make his priorities our priorities? He simply wants to seek and save the lost. He simply wants to reconcile and redeem the world. He simply wants to bridge these divides. His cross breaks down the dividing wall of hostility between Jew and Gentile, the deepest, the deepest of divisions. And so why would we allow other divisions of race, of politics, of denomination, you know, of other things that we create, the tribalisms that we create, if we're to be a friend of Jesus, aren't we then going to seek the concerns of Jesus to break down the dividing walls, to, to, to seek the things that Jesus seeks, to be concerned about his hopes and his dreams for this world, hmm. to put aside our own agendas, our own plans for a bit, so that we can do what he wants on Friday night, so to speak, right? 
So I just, I got struck by that. Jesus, what a friend for sinners, but are we, he's our friend. That, that's clear. Let's do what we can to be his friend also. You are my friends if you do what I command, is what he says. So let's love each other well, and let's love others as, as well as we can, okay? Let's take a moment to pray. Father, thank you for the friendship we have in Jesus that has brought us so many friends in the church family. Help us to be better friends of Jesus. We could not find a better friend than Jesus in his saving and his helping and his keeping and his loving and being with us to the end. May we, may we demonstrate a friendship towards Jesus with our love of each other and our love of our neighbor, our love of the stranger, our love even of those we hold to be enemies. And so we thank you that in the storms of life, he is our keeper, our guide, our pilot, and he hears our cry. Hear us as we cry out now for such a, such a life that he would have for us as we pray how he taught us to pray together, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come and thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. May your friend Jesus draw you to a deeper friendship with him, that you become his deep, deep friend, honoring his word and finding in that deeper, greater joy now and forevermore. Amen.